good to see you this morning. We're glad that you're here. And if this is your first time to be with us, please fill out one of the guest uh, cards in the pew and put it in the offering plate at the end of the service. We are so delighted to have you with us today. Also, it is a good day to be with God's people. True confession, when I woke up and saw it was cloudy outside, I just wanted to roll over and go back to sleep. Yeah, a lot of people, I'm not alone in that company, So, um, but we're here to give God the glory and the honor and the praise. I'm so glad that we came uh, into his house today, and I know that we will be all the better for it. Uh, let's try not to take our naps during the worship service. Uh, we're going to do that this Sunday afternoon, but all joking aside, we are so glad that you're here, and we have much to give thanks to the Lord for, much to give we have a lot to give thanks to the Lord for. The call to worship is taken from Psalm 111, verses 1 through 4. If you're able, will you please stand for the reading of God's holy word from Psalm 111, verses 1 through 4. And this is the word of God to the people of God. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity we have to come into this place to give you glory and honor. Lord, there is none like you. There's none who can compare with your greatness and your glory and your majesty. You are truly awesome in all your ways. Father, lift our hearts heavenward. Help us to focus upon you and, the, and upon the greatness of your glory and your plan of redemption through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, may the cares of this world be put aside. May our affections be rightly placed upon you. And may you be exalted in the midst of your people today. Lord, do great things in our hearts. Transform us. Lord, we want to live in such a way that honors you and glorifies you. Stir in us a passion for your holiness and for your ways. And we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. For the beauty for the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the sky, for the love which from my birth over and around us lies. Lord of all, Lord of all, to Thee we pray. This our hymn of For the wonder, for the wonder of each hour, of the day and of the night, hill and vale and free and flower, sun and moon and stars of night, for the ball to the joy for the joy of human love brother sister parent child friends on earth and friends above for our gentle thoughts and mouth lord of all lord of all to thee we raise this our For the church, for the church that evermore lived in holy hands above, offering up on every shore, her pure 
worship leaders here at Creek Church, and it is a pleasure to be with you all here this morning. The Lord is good, amen? Amen. He's brought us all here to worship Him, and this is why I love this segment of our worship. We get to profess our faith. We get to give God back the glory. And so this morning, how we do it here at Creek Church, I'll ask a question, and then joyously, as His bride, we will give back to Him in offering the answer. So here is the question that lies before us this morning. Why should we in Christ continue to praise the Lord, the God of Israel? And let's say this together. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him Without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Amen. Let's continue in worship, singing, What Wondrous Love Is This? is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, what wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, what wondrous, what wondrous love is this, that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul, to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. To God and to the Lamb I will sing, I will sing. To God and to the Lamb I will sing, sing. To God and to the Lamb the great I am, while millions join the theme, I will sing, I will sing, while millions join the theme, I will sing. And win from death. When from death I'm free, I'll sing on, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing on. And when from death I'm free, I'll sing and joyful be. And through eternity I'll sing on. 
I'll sing on and through eternity I'll sing announcements for us as a congregation. Uh, remember the live screen scannings that will be done here on September the 25th. Uh, please make your reservations if you'd like more information concerning um, these screenings. There are flyers on the table in the foyer. You do need to have an appointment, so you need to call, get your appointment. So just remember that. Live screen scannings, this will be September the 25th. They go from in the morning, and as long as I guess they have people booked, they'll stay. Uh, so we look forward to that on the 25th of September. Uh, this coming week, dinner or diner and gyms and cadets all kick off beginning this coming Wednesday evening starting at 5.30 p.m. So keep that in mind. Diner, gyms, and cadets all kicks off Wednesday evening starting at 5.30. Diner is a wonderful time to connect with people, to hang out with people, to get to know people in our congregation better. We hope that you can come and be a part of that. And of course, there's a lot of excitement always surrounding gyms and cadets and everything that's going on on Wednesday night. Wednesday night is the time when the church just kind of comes alive here. And I look forward to it. It's always good to hear the kids screaming and yelling in the building and all the adults to be able to talk to and just a lot of life in this place. So we just thank the Lord for that and we look forward to that happening. This coming week, Dustin and I will be uh, traveling to Atlanta, Georgia for G3 conference, a Christian conference. We'll be gone from Wednesday to Saturday. I think we'll be back Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening. Uh, Jonathan will be preaching for me next Sunday, but I will be here and um, to be able to sit under his preaching, I'm looking forward to that. I will be teaching Sunday school class, and uh, just uh, keep that in mind uh, as you pray this week. Pray for us for a time of refreshment, a time of safety and travel, and uh, that God would just have his way in our hearts. Uh, Prayer-wise, we want to pray for, um, continue to pray for Gudrun and her knee issues, for Sharon Van Wyne and her hip issues, praying for healing for her. Also, uh, Brad Holder called me uh, this, um, I think it was Friday evening, and uh, told me that um, he had just got out of the hospital, actually, and his, um, the growth of his tumor has started again. So we want to pray for them. Um, he is having some issues with seizures, so just pray for him, uh, because he does indeed need a, um, a direction on what they're going to do next, how they're going to proceed from here. So just pray for them. They have meetings with their doctors, I think, uh, this coming week. But I, I'm not sure about the dates. He wasn't that sure because um, Lindsay has all that stuff in her, in her uh, wheelhouse. And so uh, he didn't know when they, those were, but they were coming up. So just pray for them, the whole the family, and uh, just uh, for relief for... Um, the seizures that Brad is struggling with and uh, just continue to lift them up. Very difficult time for them. We have several who are traveling. Uh, we have uh, others who are still shut in. Our prayer list continues to grow in our email, uh, weekly email that goes out. So continue to pray over those needs for the community of faith during the week. And uh, there are a lot of issues on a lot of hearts today. So let us come before God's throne of grace, you in the quietness of your own heart as I lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your faithfulness and your grace to us. And we pray, Lord, that you would do your work in us today and that you would continue, Lord, to encourage our hearts, that you would strengthen us. Lord, I am so thankful today that there is no shadow of turning with you, that you are absolute. You work in accordance with all your decrees. And Lord, you are so faithful to your covenant people. Lord, it is so easy for us to fall into the, just the habit of seeing our lives largely from the perspective of us, that we look at it from the context of our own inner workings in the world, and Lord, we so, so often we fail to stop, Lord, and, and just to remember that there's a context to our existence that is greater and more grand than, than we could even completely even know or 
fully fathomed. Father, I thank you that you are at work in our lives as individuals and as families. And Lord, that even now, by your sovereign hand, that you are able to change and transform hearts, that you are able to bring restoration to your covenant people's lives. And Lord, whether it be relationship issues or whether it be issues regarding health, Lord, we we know that you are the one who is even sovereign and supreme over all those things. So, Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for restoration. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would do his work in us, that we would find the encouragement and the fact that our hearts and our souls and our lives are anchored in Christ, that that would be the source of that encouragement. Lord, we pray for the Hulbert of family. We pray for them. And, Lord, we pray for Brad's complete and total healing. We pray for direction for their lives. Father, we pray that you would guide and direct his doctors and nurses. Use them to minister your grace into his life. We pray that your purposes may come to fulfillment, Lord. And, Father, I pray that you would bring rest to their hearts and their souls. And, Lord, that they would continue to look to you, Lord, in the midst of this difficult time. Lord, be glorified even through this. And Father, we pray for the seizures, that they would go away, that Brad would have no more complications with seizures. And Lord, that he would be free from them. And Lord, we pray for uh, continued encouragement for uh, not only Brad and, and uh, just the whole family, but Lord, for all of those who are connected to this family in one way or another. Lord, may we truly be sources of encouragement and showing love and affection to this family. Father, we pray for Sharon. We pray for healing for her hip, that you would restore her and heal her. And Lord, we pray that she would soon be back with us. We pray for Goodwin. We pray for healing for her uh, knee, that the swelling would go down, that you would continue to strengthen and encourage her. Father, we pray that as um, Dustin and I travel this week, that you would give us safety. And Lord, that the conference would be something that is glorifying to you and edifying to your people. And Father, there will be thousands of people who are coming. And we pray for your um, hand of protection over all those who will be traveling. We pray for those who are traveling within our own congregation, Lord. And we pray for your hand of protection over them, that you would give them safety. Lord, we thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. We thank you, Lord, that our sins are forgiven. And, Lord, that you are continuing to do your work to bring your transforming grace to bear upon our lives. Lord, continue to use this service for your glory and for your honor through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we ask all these things in his precious name. Amen. Stand. Well, brothers and sisters, this morning, again, uh, we get... Uh, just a blessed chance uh, to give God the glory and praise as we continue in this worship service. But we should continue and always praise God that, you know, though through the clouds of doubt and they threaten to sometimes block the sun, but that those clouds, they cannot diminish the heat of God's love for us. If we are truly in Christ, our fluctuating experiences is no match for the evidence that God has provided us in his son, Jesus Christ. Scripture says God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What a glorious truth. Please, if you, if you are able to continue on singing, uh, sing with us, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. He is all-sufficient." Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him. Sing that part again, oh for grace. Oh for grace 
to trust him more. Tis so sweet. It's so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know the Savior. So sweet. It's so sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to see, just from Jesus simply taking life. Trust in his cleansing blood, trust him, and in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing blood. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I'm so glad. I'm so glad I learned to trust the precious Jesus, Savior. Gracious Father, we are glad. We are glad that we have learned to trust you. But Lord, it hasn't been because of our own doing. Lord, it is because of your gracious mercy and grace towards us that you've given us the Spirit, Lord, that has given us the ability to trust you. And Lord, we trust the precious Jesus, the one who, who was and who was and he's, 
he's coming again. He is our Savior. He is our friend. But, Lord, we know that you and he is with us. Continue to guide us, Lord, in this service. Illumine our hearts and minds to hear the preaching of your gospel. And, Lord, we pray that you would be with Pastor Brett as he preaches. Convict us, Lord, of our sins. But show us your mercy and grace in your son, Jesus Christ, all the more. We pray this in his name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if you have your Bibles, you want to turn to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22, we are looking at a sermon entitled, The Future of the Covenant, from Genesis 22, 15 through 19. Remember the illustration that I used last Sunday in the sermon regarding the Christian life and our tendency to paint by numbers versus seeing the grand tapestry of God's beauty and glory and the artistic work that he alone is capable of. We want to see that to a greater and greater degree. The Christian life is lived out not out of principles that we create for ourselves, but it's lived out of a love and admiration of the God who loves us, the covenant faithful God who gave his own son to die for us. And so that is what we anchor in, is what we continue to gaze at and look at. And through that joy we have because of who our God is, that is what drives us on in this world. And it can get tired sometimes, can't it? can't it? Yeah, it can. It can get old sometimes. But we have something greater, more grand that we are living for, a higher purpose in ourselves. So we want to keep these things in mind as we look at this text this morning, the future of the covenant from Genesis 22, 15 through 19. And this is the word of God to the people of God. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. And this is the word of God to the people of God. You may be seated. In all the years that I was in school, all the way from grade school, high school, Bible college, seminary, my favorite part of taking a test was always to know that the test was over and that I passed. I mean, that's the part I look forward to. Sometimes I would even sit there and tell myself, come on, just keep moving, keep moving, keep going to the test, hopefully you'll pass (laughs) and it'll be over soon. Well, Abraham may have felt that way after sacrificing the ram caught in the thicket that we talked about last week and then hearing the Lord's voice of affirmation confirming that he passed. It was then that the Lord ratified the covenant yet again with Abraham by making the point that he was swearing an oath in demonstration of his covenant intentions to Abraham. Look back at your text to verses 15 through 16 at what I'm calling the supremacy of the oath. The supremacy of the oath in verses 15 through 16 of our text. We see these words, And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. The Lord swore by himself to Abraham. Stop and let that sink in just for a moment. The Lord swore by an oath to Abraham. You see, he swore by himself to Abraham an oath because there was no higher authority for him to swear by than himself. 
There was no higher authority, no greater being in existence than God alone to call God to account regarding his oath to Abraham. You see, God doesn't need an accountability partner. God is totally sufficient in and of himself within the confines of the relationship of the Trinity. So when he swears to Abraham an oath and he swears by himself, the Lord understands that his oath is supreme because of the supreme essence of his fidelity and the goodness of his holy character. There's not another being in existence that is like this. The covenant that God made with Abraham was a covenant that pulled Abraham and his descendants away from trusting in any sense of self-sufficiency that they had. Abraham understood this. He knew that it wouldn't be because of him. Oh, he may have displayed his faith in the context of the test that we have seen, but God knew and Abraham knew that it would all be of the working of God that would bring it to pass. You ever heard the saying, if you want anything done right, you have to do it yourself? Surely you've heard this. You may have even repeated that to you this morning when you were making breakfast or maybe even when you, uh, this last week, when you were at work and you saw something that was undone. Uh, It may be something that you gave a task to one of your kids to do and you hoped that they would go and do it and complete the task and then you go back and you see that they left the task undone and those words come across your mind and you say to yourself, if you want anything done right, you've got to do it yourself. Katie knows that way too well, doesn't she? (laughs) This saying may have some merit when we are dealing with fallen human beings. Most of us are aware of that. Most of us are aware of that. That's why we say it sometimes. But it never has merit before the face of God in making good on His covenant promises because God always does it right. God can't do other than do it right. God has to do it exactly as it is according to his plan and his purpose. God is the supreme being and there is no higher moral character possible to undergird his promises. He does not change like shifting shadows and his character is unchanging. The writer of the book of Hebrews by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit gives us divine insight to the spiritual truth revealed here in Genesis twenty-two fifteen 15 through 16. When we have the divine commentary on a passage of Scripture, like our text this morning, we have divine insight on how we are to understand it. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 through 17, picks up on the implications behind the supremacy of the Lord's oath to Abraham. Verse 13 of Hebrews 6, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, An oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. He guaranteed it with an oath. You see, the writer of Hebrews picks up on this whole thing that's going on in Genesis 22. And he understands by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that God making an oath was making the covenant definite. There was no way it could be changed. There's no way it could be thwarted. It's the only thing in the universe that we're able to bank on 100%. I remember the stories of the old men 
back in my hometown, when they would tell the stories of the past, they would make statements sometimes of, yeah, we never had a contract. We just gave our word and we shook hands on it. Some of you may be able to remember those times when those guys uh, where you may have saw them when you were just a kid. You may have saw your father or you may have saw another person who was a businessman uh, just shaking hands on an agreement that they made by their own oath. They were making that agreement and then they shake hands to kind of confirm it as being their bond, something that they would abide by. There was no written contract in those days. And actually, seldom were contracts ever drawn up. Men just did as they said they would do. And and to insist on a contract with someone in that context, it was almost insulting. Oh, I I know that we can say the words, and I know that we can shake on it, but, you know, I think I'd rather have a contract with you. Well, in those days, that would have been a slight jab at the other person's character. To insist on a contract with someone you knew well was like an insult to their character. The reason why we've come to this place where we prefer contracts is because, well, you see, time has a way of revealing what is in the hearts of men. And when they do not seek to reflect their fidelity to their covenants with one another, you need a contract, you need something written, you need something tangible that you can go back and point to and say, see, this is what you said. I want to hold you accountable to this contract. That's why today we usually insist on contracts, to make sure all the terms and the expectations are spelt out and to impose a measure of accountability by the legalities of a contract especially when there's a lot of money involved. But but even then, a person's ability to carry out such contractual agreements is bound to so many things. It's tied to so many variables that they may not even have control over. I have a relative who was a contractor, used to be in St. Louis, Missouri, and he was a guy who poured concrete and he would often go in to where they were building homes and he was working with another contractor who he subbed under and he would subcontract the contract, uh, the concrete work. And uh, he told me of a time where he said, you know, we never did it on a contract. We just, we just would go in and shake hands on it and it was our oath and that kind of thing. And then one day he says, I poured all of this concrete and I noticed that I hadn't got paid yet. And I went to see this gentleman and I said, you know, I've never gotten my check. Uh, what's, what's the deal? And he says, well, I don't think I'm going to pay you. And my cousin said, what? What do you mean? You're not going to pay me. I've, I've done all this work on this, on this uh, complex, this housing complex, and, and, and you're not going to pay me now. He says, yeah. He said, I'm going to use this to teach you a lesson that you never want to enter into something like this without a contract in written format. Wow, what a tough lesson. It cost my cousin tens of thousands of dollars that he lost because of that. And we all have heard stories like that in in the world in which we live. It's because there is such a thing as evil in the world that people are fallen in their natures. Christian, but with the Lord, he swore by himself a covenant with Abraham that had the conditions of the fulfillment of that covenant tied directly to it and then undergirded by the divine grace of the covenant faithful God. And Abraham didn't need a contract. You notice here that we read in this passage and we don't see Abraham saying, "Uh, God, could you please... uh, you know, like send a people piece of paper down with your signature on it? Could you spell out the terms for me? Could you send those down? Now, we do have the written word. Uh, Moses eventually wrote it down. This is why the Old Testament is called a testament. It is bearing witness about something that God has declared. And so we can go, we can read 
the terms of the contract, so to speak. But understand that Abraham didn't have any of that. All he had was God speaking to him and affirming himself over and over again in his provision to him. That's all Abraham had. Today we have both. We have the written terms of the contract, but we've all seen God being at work in our lives, providing for us in ways that we never thought possible. In all those areas and ways in which we thought we'd never make it through, somehow we did make it through and we're still standing, and it's all because of what God has been doing in our lives. He has bound himself to us in contractual terms, we know, through Jesus Christ, yes, because we understand the fulfillment of it all. But for Abraham, it was not that way. All he had was the Word of God speaking to him the terms of the contract. You see, you're only in need of a contract when a party can't be trusted to keep their end of the bargain, and God made himself the one who determined the fulfillment of the covenant. The only way the covenant would would fail or falter would be that if God himself did not keep his end of the bargain. All Abraham had to do was just to believe in the I will identity and fidelity of the eternal God. And that is exactly what faith does, doesn't it? That's exactly what faith does. It ties us to the certainty of the promises given due to the absolute fidelity and greatness of the character of Almighty God who can only be capable of success. He can only be capable of success in accomplishing his purposes. This means he is incapable of failure, obviously. God can't fail. He's only able to fulfill and to make things complete. He's incapable of failure in everything, especially when it comes to his ultimate plan and his ultimate purpose. Now this may cause us to raise a question about the application of the supreme oath and how it makes a difference to us in our lives, in our human existence. We may have that question, how does this then, this truth about the fidelity of God, connect to us? How do we draw the the, the line from the, the dot of God's faithfulness down to us and the absolute certainty that we can have knowing that this will come to bear upon our lives? How is it that we can know this for certain? We may want to know the answer to this because we live in an insecure world as insecure people. But the Lord appointed Abraham, the Lord pointed Abraham to another place for his sense of security. He directs Abraham back to the I will of his covenant faithful God. Look back at your text in verses 17 through 19 at what I'm calling the security of the blessing. We see these words in verse 17 through 19. I will. See those two words? Familiar, aren't they? They're connected all up through the covenant affirmation. We see it here again, 17. I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, And Abraham lived at Beersheba. You see the repetitive nature of the I will statements that God makes here as he speaks to Abraham in verses 17 through 19. God gets ready to expand on the covenant blessings that are going to come to Abraham and to his offspring and through his offspring. And most of us will sit, we'll read this, and we'll think, oh yeah, the Jewish people he's talking about the Jewish people. I would say to you, no, he's not talking about the Jewish people. He's not talking about the Jewish people. You see, he secures our blessings through the gospel. And you say, now wait a minute, pastor. I was following you 
verses 17 through 19, and I never saw the word gospel one single time. And now here you are bringing up the gospel yet again. I caught you. (laughs) You're putting something in that's not there. Where do you get that this is somehow talking about the gospel in these verses? I'm so glad you asked that question. I really am. I am glad you asked that question because I get it from the divine commentary in Galatians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, where the Apostle Paul is explaining how it is that those who have faith, those are the ones who are the true descendants of Abraham. You say, oh no, it's the Jewish people. No, no, you, you don't understand. The New Testament understands the covenant ratification in a completely different way than just applying it ethnically to the Jewish people. And there are those who do that today. They they do that all the time. There are uh, uh, Christians who often subscribe to a view that's called dispensationalism. And they emphasize this whole thing about the promises being given to the Jewish people alone. But yet, when you read the New Testament and you see the apostolic take on the covenant promises, you realize that, oh my goodness, no, it's a whole lot bigger than just the Jewish people. So we read where the Apostle Paul explains this in Galatians 3, 7-9. through The text says, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of the faith are blessed along with Abraham the man of faith. So the phrase that we see here in Galatians 3, in you shall all the nations be blessed, there in Galatians 3, 8, is a quote from the Old Covenant, the covenant promise of blessing as we see in our text in Genesis 22, 17 through 19. So Paul, writing to the Galatian church, is explaining what that term means from the Abrahamic covenant, and he's putting it in a New Testament context to the people of God, the Christians at Galatia. So understanding the divine commentary is that the Abrahamic covenant contained a statement that was proclaiming the gospel in such a way as to be not just a promise to Jews, but a promise to Gentiles to people like most of us. So the reality is, when God said to Abraham in the covenant ratification in Genesis 22, 17 through 19, all nations, all peoples will be blessed through you, that was the scripture foreseeing that God would Scripture by the Holy Spirit that God would justify not just the Jews by faith, but the Gentiles as well, because that was the gospel, and that's where I get the gospel in Genesis 22, 17 through 19. And we're told there, Genesis 22, 17 through 19, that the covenant blessing will come through Abraham's offspring. This is important because through this offspring, descendants will be multiplied in numbers like the stars and like sand grains on the seashore. Through your offspring. We see that Genesis 22, 17, first half of verse 17. And this offspring will possess the gates of his enemies, Second half of verse 17. And this offspring will be the means of blessing to the nations. Verse 18. Genesis 22, verse 18. So the question is, is who is this offspring? Now some like to say, well, it's talking about the Jewish people. 
No, it's not talking about the Jewish people. Some say, well, it's talking about Isaac. No, it's not talking about Isaac. You say, oh, yeah, it is, Pastor. I know the Old Testament. I know that Abraham had Isaac. Isaac was his chosen seed, and that's how we know who the offspring is. And if you were a Muslim and you were here today, you'd say, ah, you got it all wrong. It's talking about Ishmael. It's talking about Ishmael. You want to know why there's so much conflict between those three major world religions? It's because they all have a different offspring that they're looking at. They're emphasizing. There's other reasons, too, but that's one of the great dividing points regarding the world religions, uh, the, the great theistic religions of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. So who is this offspring that the Lord is speaking of? And I think we need to know who the offspring is before we can actually identify the nature of the promises made in order to understand the fulfillment of those promises. Because if you believe that the offspring is Isaac, you're going to be looking for the fulfillment in land promises. You're going to be looking for everything going on over in Israel as being so important, so critical to the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. If you're a Muslim, you're going to say, well, the offspring is important because everybody knows it's Ishmael. At least every Muslim does. It's Ishmael, and, and that's what everyone needs to understand. And if it is Ishmael, you're going to look at the fulfillment of those promises being connected to your possession of that real estate over in Palestine about the size of New Jersey. But for Christianity, it's radically different. Again, the divine commentary helps us in an enormous way in Galatians 3.16. We see the Apostle Paul. Remember, we've already been to Galatians chapter 3. I read to you earlier from 7 through 9. If you, go, if you were to go down in verse 16, you would see this verse, and it says, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. See that? Verse 16. And look, it does not say into offsprings. Makes the emphatic point. Referring to many, but referring to one. So let me read it in context. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say into offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. Who is Christ? And you're like, wait a minute. Jesus wasn't born until like thousands of years later. How in the world could he be the offspring? I mean, couldn't, couldn't Jesus and Ishmael and Isaac, I mean, couldn't they just agree to share it all? I mean, that would solve a lot of problems. That would get rid of a lot of the conflict in the world, especially over in the Middle East. I mean, couldn't they just share it all? Couldn't we just have a blending of the religions together and somehow make it all one big happy family because we're all theistic religions? And there are people on earth who actually believe that that would be the greatest thing that could ever happen. From God's perspective, it would be the worst thing that could ever happen. You say, how do you know? Because he did not decree it to be so. That is not what his decrees have unfolded. Christ is the offspring. Let me explain it to you. Isaac was a type. He was an illustration. He was a picture of what was to come. As a matter of fact, as we continue to, to go through this, covenant seri this series on the covenant, we will see that there are connections to Moses. There are connections to King David too. And you'll see that there are things said in those covenants that God made that are in connection with the person and work of Christ. And that all of those covenants, they were really just pointing to a future time when they would be fulfilled in Christ. We have to understand that as Christians. 
Because he gives the blessing through Christ as the offspring of Abraham. Galatians 3.16. Christ came into the world to conquer his enemies. He stormed the gates of sin and death on behalf of his people. He led captivity captive. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. He is the first and the last, the living one. He died but is now alive forevermore. And he holds the keys of death and Hades. No one but Christ alone. He is so glorious and mighty in the power of His deliverance of God's people that Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 through 17 describes it this way. John says this, he says, After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and forever. Amen. Be to our God forever and ever. Be to our God forever and ever. I didn't mean to bring a Petra song into the sermon today, but it just had a ring of truth to it. What I just read to you, let me tell you something. Ishmael can't do that. (laughs) Ishmael couldn't do that. Ishmael couldn't fulfill all that. Ishmael couldn't bring all that to pass on his best day. Isaac, he couldn't do that. No, he couldn't do that. So sure he could. He's he's the chosen child. The one that God selected. God selected Isaac because in the line of Isaac, Messiah would come into the world. Isaac couldn't do that on his best day. Let's be honest. Isaac had a very difficult time even telling his sons apart. (laughs) He couldn't do this, not this. Both Islam and Judaism come short. And let me say this emphatically this morning. Those who believe all religions are valid ways to God have never come to terms with the biblical truth of the exclusivity of Jesus Christ as the eternal Son of God who came into the world, who took on flesh to ransom people for God by His death, burial, and His resurrection. There is none like Him. None like Him. If Jesus Christ was not exclusive, I'd close up shop. I'd resign tomorrow. I would be done preaching from pulpits. I would never again try to share the gospel with anyone. People could just live their own way, do their own thing, determine their own religious ideologies that they want and just live those out because in the end, God is just going to put his stamp of approval on all of them and say, oh, you all made the best effort possible. I'm going to let you all all into my kingdom. Don't even worry. Everything's fine. And you know that's not true, don't you? And that's one of the reasons why we preach. That is one of the reasons we want to adjust our thinking and understanding the covenant, the implications of what God is doing, how it comes to bear upon our lives. Some of us think, well, I'm saved. I can just go on now and live my life the way I want. No, because you'll create yourself as being the one who is supreme. Even, yes, over your Christianity, you will design a Christianity that fits you, that accommodates you. You will not adopt the Christianity of the Bible unless God is the one who opens your eyes and brings it to bear upon your life. 
life through a miraculous work of the Spirit of God. And even then, you'll still try to throw your little adjustments in to make it fit you, to accommodate your sinful lifestyle, to accommodate your worldview. And yet you're, you're thinking of this whole thing like it's all about you. And it's not. It's about Christ. You see, Ishmael can't do it, Isaac can't do it, and neither can we. All you have to do is look around this world, you'll find there's not a lasting and eternal hope to be found in the world systems of governments or religions of men. They're not there. You won't find it. And for those of you who may think that when I say things like that, oh man, our pastor is so pessimistic. He needs a fresh dose of optimism. Can he get with the program? I want to tell you, that is not, what I said about the exclusivity of Christ is not pessimistic hopelessness. But it is a statement of the absolute reality of what we see in the world. We can see the brokenness in the world. For crying out loud, we can see the brokenness in our own hearts. In our own lives. And we can bear to look. The Christian is not called to be in denial about the condition of the world. And to then attach a false hope to it. To make people feel better psychologically, emotionally. The Christian is called to anchor their hope in Christ in anticipation of what is to come. And we are called and commanded to tell others where they can find it and how they can have it. That's where evangelism comes in. Unbeliever, you must be born again. And I don't back away from telling you that. As a matter of fact, I tell you that out of love. Because if you are not born again and you're not in Christ, you will have to stand before a holy God and one day you will have to give an account on your own. You will have to give an account of your actions and how you lived and the motivations that drove you through your whole life. And you're going to have to give an account to the holy judge who is seated on the throne. This is not like coming before Judge Wapner or Judge Judy or that guy I see on Facebook post sometimes, that old gentleman who, if you can just go up and tell a nice story, he just says, oh, let's just dismiss the charges. (laughs) There were some insinuating circumstances in this situation I don't remember his name that's the kind of judge I'd like to have when I get my speeding ticket that my girls say it's coming dad it's coming it's coming God is an absolute holy God who will judge the quick and the dead with absolute justice and righteousness. And that is the most scary thing in all the universe if you are not in Christ. You need to believe the gospel. Put your faith in Christ to trust in him that you might be saved. Christ took your place on the cross 2,000 years ago. He died in the place of sinners. He absorbed the wrath of God on the cross for you. Oh, make that your own today. Believe it by grace through faith alone. Believers, when I stand here and tell you Sunday after Sunday to put your trust in the only covenant faithful God that there is, This is not pie in the sky. 
It's not just Christian optimism. It, it's, not, it's not being said just because to blow a little sunshine your way. It's because the absolute reality of your place in Christ has secured you once and for all time before the throne of God if you are truly in Christ. And you say, how can I know that? Well, you can go back and reread Genesis 22. <laughs> and you'll know it the same way Abraham knew it. And you can understand the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant connected to the finished work of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, and you will know. And there are people that you will encounter and they will say to you things like, how do you know you can trust that your being a Christian is right, that your Christianity is true and right? And when people say things like that to me, I usually start with a history, land, uh, history lesson. And you know where I usually go back to? I go back to Abraham. I said, you ever heard of this guy? And a lot of people have heard of Abraham. And then I do a little history lesson on sacrifices and covenant promises that were made. I take the person through the Old Testament very briefly, bring it up to the current day because of all that Christ has done. I talk about the cross, the connections to the Old Covenant, the sacrificial system, to what Abraham had done. And then I bring it to the reality of the cross in the current day of, a, of the hope of the gospel that is put before us. You see, if you don't understand the covenant fidelity of God and the overarching truth of these covenant implications, when people ask you and they say, so tell me, give me a reason for the hope that lies within you, you're probably going to be going like, well, I'm a good person. I'm moral, and I think moral living is the way to go. Well, that's a pretty good answer, except for the problem that Jesus said in Matthew 5, that even if you hate someone in your heart, you've committed murder. When you give answers like that, you're just pointing to something that is relative to you and not relative to God. If you want to know what God says, you've got to understand the covenant implications of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and how they come to bear on the person and work of Christ. You see, if there's nothing in you, content-wise, when people ask you for a reason for the hope that you have, you're not going to be able to give them anything. You're going to be like a, a water fountain that's been shut off on a hot day. You ever been real thirsty and you're like, oh, I can't wait to get a drink. You push the button and nothing comes out because it's out of order. Ours was like that. We had it turned off for COVID. <laughs> I've seen people going over there. and I did it too sometimes without thinking. See, if there's nothing in you, you're not going to have anything to let out and to communicate and to preach back to people. We need to understand these truths because they undergird our understanding of the gospel. You can talk about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, but if you don't understand that that's, a, that's set into a context and what that context is, you're never going to get past just talking about the fact that he died. But when people say, well, why is that important? You're going to be sitting there like, blah, 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 I don't know. Because the connections go back to the old covenant. When I say put your trust in the co only covenant faithful God that there is, you know there's a context to that statement that actually undergirds everything about you. 
And you may not be worried about it right now. Or you may not even be thinking about it right now. And you may not think that's important right now. But I'll tell you somebody that we all know that thinks that's important right now. His name is Brad Holwerda. He thinks that's really important right now. Because he understands that in the midst of this, and he told me this on the phone as I was driving, talking to him, going down the road. He said, you know what, Pastor? I'm not afraid. I know that God has this. One way or another, he has it, and he has me, and he has my family, and I am certain of that. And that is why Brad Holverda has hope today. You see, you may be thinking right now, the only thing you're worried about is getting out of here. Because you want to go home because you got a pot roast in the crock pot and you hope it don't overcook. But this is far more important than your pot roast. If you've ever had a sick child that doctors couldn't give answers to. Or maybe you got your own diagnosis. Or you've been let go from your company after 20-something years. Or the stock market really has taken, caused your portfolio to take a hit. Or the political situation in our world where we may be all wondering what's going to happen. There's only one place you can go to. The throne of Almighty God. And you have a direct connection to it because of everything he has promised and everything that he has done. I love it when I, and I've done this with some of you, I've stood and heard your story. And you've told me about how God worked in your life. Some of my favorite stories when people tell me, Man, we went through so many hard times. We thought we were going to have to sell the house and the kids. <laughs> and God brought us through. And you could even put your finger on the exact time and thing that he did. Because I've heard you testify to this. It was this. He opened this door. And that changed everything for us. And all you've seen is the faithfulness of God working through those situations. You know why you saw it? Well, but Yeah, Pastor, because I'm a good person and God wants to bless me. No! I mean, He does want to bless you, but that's His covenant fidelity to you because of what Christ has done. He has obligated himself voluntarily to you. That is what grace is about. And he is there in the good times, and he is there in the bad times, and he is the one who is there, present in your life, keeping you afloat. It's not you, it's him. You may feel like you're like Abraham this morning. You're in a dilemma. You're on Mount Moriah. And it seems like there's something else on the altar. And maybe God has brought you to this point to show you the sufficiency of himself and nothing else. we had time this morning, we could have testimony time. I look around this room, everywhere I look, it's almost, I'm just getting other things about sermon, <laughs> sermon things that I'm wanting to talk about because I've seen, I've seen it in your life over and over and over and over again. Some of you shouldn't even be here. 
You shouldn't be on planet Earth. You should be six foot under, and here you are. Here you are. God did that through his covenant faithfulness. A God who has been so faithful, will he not be faithful to us tomorrow too? Will he not be faithful in the future? Oh, I think so. I know so. Christian, confess your sin. And know that he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all your unrighteousness. And rest in him. He alone is sufficient for us. Let's pray. Father, your covenant fidelity amazes us. So easy for us to think about the mundane things of life, the things that we put priority on and we fail to remember. It is all by your hand. You sustain us. You keep us. Lord, we all think of our brother Brad. We pray for him today. Thank you for the faith that you've worked in him and the faith that you've worked in Lindsay and her family. I thank you that there is a rock that the people of God stand on that is unmovable and unshakable. Though everything else on earth gives way, Christ is our hope and stay. Father, may we never forget we have been bought with a price that we are your covenant people. We belong to you. Our children belong to you. Our material blessings and our wealth, the Lord, it's all yours. It all came from your hand. All the way back tied back to the covenant fidelity and the promise that all nations of the earth will be blessed because of what you have done. Father, your covenant fidelity is astounding. Thank you for the provision of your grace to us. Forgive us and cleanse us of our unrighteousness. Wash us in the blood. Stir in us, Lord, a passion for your glory. Lord, I pray today if there be anyone here within the sound of my voice who does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that today their eyes may be opened to the truth of the gospel that they may truly believe unto salvation. From the oldest to the youngest, Lord, do your work. Be glorified through your covenant of redemption in Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Please stand. Worthy is that. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. 
God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Rainbows of living water, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing on, blessing and honor, the strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Holy, holy, holy. For you. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name, Jesus. Jesus, your name is power, breath, and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Should I sing praise to the King of Kings? You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. If you believe it, sing it out with all creation. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. be to God. Let's pray over our offerings. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity we have to give of our tithes and offerings. May you take what is given and use it for the furthering work of your kingdom. Lord, may you continue to bless your covenant people. Keep us in your gracious care and may your blessings continue to abound to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, we will have Sunday school kicking off about 10 after 11. It'll go to 12:10, so keep that in mind. And now receive the benediction from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Shake a few hands, hug a few necks, join us in the fellowship hall for some eating and fellowship action.
once I was lost, wandering in darkness, no life inside, no hope inside, but he called my name, and he healed my blindness, said Through my heart of stone, love breathing to awake my bone, love reaching out to save my soul, love never gonna let me go. And now my heart, so full of worship, I can't hold back. He's done, Jesus, my Savior. I am a place and full of things for His love breaking through my heart of stone, love breathing to awake my bones, love reaching out to save my soul, love never gonna let me go, love calling me. gonna let me go wherever you've been wherever you done come as you are come into his open arms wherever you've been whatever you done come as you are come and find his love break into you are Love breathing to awake my bones Love reaching out to save my soul Love never gonna let me go Love calling me as I am Love making me new again Love lifting me when I can Love never gonna let me go Love breathing my heart of stone Love breathing to awake my